Good afternoon, and welcome to another edition of the virtual book talk series sponsored by the program in the history of the book in American culture, or FIBEC, at the American Antiquarian Society. I'm Kevin Wisniewski, Director of Book History and Digital Initiatives here at the American Antiquarian Society, and I am joined by my friend and AAS colleague, Amanda Kondak. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar with AAS, the Society was founded in 1812 by printer Isaiah Thomas. We are a research library and learned society located in Worcester, Massachusetts, devoted to understanding and sharing the history and culture of this nation before the 20th century. As a library, we collect, preserve, and share the printed record of what is now the United States, portions of Canada, and the Caribbean. And our collections include books and pamphlets, newspapers and periodicals, manuscripts, and the graphic arts. Uh, today's event features uh, Whitman College professor Adam Gordon, uh, and it is part of a series uh, of monthly book talks dedicated to the history and the future of the book. Each month, we invite an author of a recently published monograph or digital equivalent to share that work and to answer a few questions from those in attendance. Uh, now, before I introduce today's guest, I'd like to turn uh, things over to my colleague, Amanda, who will give a quick overview of the platform we're using and some of its features. Thank you, Kevin, um, and welcome everyone. It's great to virtually introduce myself. Um, before we get started, I do have a few notes on the mechanics of our Zoom webinar format. For the Q&A portion of the program, we'll be using the Q&A function, which is located on the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you have any questions for Adam during or after his presentation, please type them in there. As attendees, you will also have the option to upvote your favorite questions submitted by others by selecting the thumbs up icon. And we'll get to these questions at the end of our program. The chat function is also open, so feel free to send your comments to all attendees and panelists. Uh, throughout the presentation, I will also be posting additional information and links about in the chat relating to our speaker, AAS, and Quebec, and you should be able to save the chat by clicking on the three dots in the chat window. If you have any problems with your visual or audio settings, you can also message me privately in the chat. And finally, I would like to let everyone know that we are recording this program, so for those who can't attend or for those who would like to rewatch it, we will be posting it on our YouTube channel. And I'll put those links in the chat in a few moments as well. So thank you everyone and Kevin, back to you. Great, thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, now I'd like to just jump right in and introduce today's guest. Uh, Adam Gordon is Associate Professor of English at Whitman College, uh, specializing in early and 19th century American literature, print culture, and the history of American literary criticism. He received his BA in English from the University of Pennsylvania and his PhD from UCLA. He is the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, including the John B. Hench Post-Dissertation Fellowship here at the American Antiquarian Society, the Greenfield Dissertation Fellowship at the Library, of Co Library Company of Pennsylvania, uh, of Philadelphia, pardon me, uh, the William K. Peck uh, and Mellon Foundation Fellowships at the Huntington Library. Uh, his articles have appeared in journals such as American Literature, Arizona Quarterly, the Nathaniel Hawthorne Review, and Early American Literature. At Whitman, his regular courses include surveys on American uh, literature, seminars on Poe, Melville and the Literature of Slavery, as well as introductory courses on poetry and fiction. His book-length study, Prophets, Publicists, and Parasites, Antebellum, Print Culture, and the Rise of the Critic, which is the topic of today's talk, was published by the University of Massachusetts Press this past February. Uh, and shortly, Amanda will be posting a link to the publisher's page uh, for those interested in ordering a copy. Uh, with that, I would like to welcome Adam Gordon. Adam, please share your screen. There you are. Hi. So, welcome. <laughs> um, can, you, can you see and hear me in our Zoomverse? 
We, we can hear and see you well, thank you. Okay, great. Um, well, thanks for that introduction, Kevin, and thank you to Amanda uh, also. Um, so I, I wanna start out more generally by um, thanking all of you for um, taking time today to be here. Um, I know that these are tense days with the pandemic and for a fellow teachers, online teaching and the election a few days away. So I really do appreciate you um, taking a little bit of time to hear about my book. Um, as I noted, I also wanna thank Kevin, Amanda and the American Antiquarian Society for putting together this uh, really amazing series, right? That's bringing us together even though we're all um, distanced from one another these days um, and for inviting me to speak today. So a little bit of Adam trivia though that some of you may know, um, I actually grew up in Worcester, Massachusetts um, and drove by the Antiquarian Society every day without really knowing what was inside. So um, it was a homecoming of sorts when I received the Hench Dissertation Fellowship back in 2011. Um, and like many before me in this book series, I can say honestly that this book wouldn't exist without AAS. So I'm, I'm truly grateful to Paul Erickson, Lauren Hughes, Laura Wasowitz, Ashley Cataldo, Elizabeth Pope, so many others uh, on the staff at AAS, um, as well as the other research fellows who helped me think through this project during a formative stage of its reconception. Um, there are also countless others that supported and guided me over the years, um, some of whom are here today, friends and family, including my parents, my sister, my girlfriend Molly, uh, professors at UPenn and UCLA, colleagues both here at Whitman College and elsewhere, uh, the peer reviewers and the team at UMass Press. Uh, all of you helped make this book and I'm deeply grateful to you. Um, and thanks finally to everyone who bought this book so far. Uh, crazy, I read a book. <laughs> um, if you're interested, you can uh, get it by following uh, the, the links that Amanda's providing. Um, also Amazon or independent bookstores like Powell's. Um, yeah, so. Thanks for those of you who have it. And for those who don't, um, yeah, I hope you get it. Okay, um, so before I jump into the heart of my argument, I actually wanna start with a more recent episode that I talk about in the book's coda. Uh, so I teach in Walla Walla, Washington, where I'm speaking to you from right, right now, um, which is a small town located in Eastern Washington state. Uh, but a few years ago, in the summer of 2016, I decided to spend the summer in Seattle as I finished up my book uh, manuscript and began shopping for publishers. At the time, amazon.com, which I'm sure as many of you know, is located in Seattle, is based in Seattle, um, had recently opened a pilot brick and mortar bookstore, which they called Amazon Books. And here's an image of it. Since then, it's expanded to 19 stores in 10 states. But at the time, it was a relatively new experiment and one that struck me as odd, frankly. I mean, after all, it was online behemoths like Amazon that helped put bookstore chains like Borders and Walden Books out of business, to say nothing of small independent bookstores. But I love books and I was curious, so I headed over to the upscale University Village Shopping Center near the University of Washington to check it out. In many ways, the store was similar to other retail chains like Barnes & Noble, though it distinguished itself from them by ruthlessly applying the logic of online bookselling, driven by algorithms and user data to the brick and mortar bookstore. For instance, um, and the photo is not, not very good, I didn't know at the time that I'd be using this in the book when I took pictures, but, um, but here on the left behind this browsing gentleman is a table of books, um, quote, as the sign said, rated 4.8 or above by users all the books on the table. Um, so too, the books, as you see on the right, were shelved cover out rather than spine out, replicating the experience of internet browsing and prioritizing bestsellers over an extensive backlist of slower sellers. Yet what struck me the most was the small placard that the clerks placed beneath each book. Um, aside from a barcode that you could scan to bring up the book on your phone on the Amazon website, each book contained a blurb from an Amazon customer who had reviewed the book. Here's a closer up. Um, for example, beneath a copy of Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale, which I'm sure a lot of you have read, a card noted that uh, the reaction of quote, a customer 
that read, chilling, moving, vivid, terrifying, and sometimes even humorous, The Handmaid's Tale is a profoundly moral story. It is a true masterpiece of power and grace that will someday attain the status of a classic. And beneath that, uh, it said that 217 people found this review helpful and that of the 2,063 reviews, it uh, generated an average score of 4.1 stars. So at the time that I saw this, uh, I was finishing up a book about criticism in antebellum America, a period when the rise of industrial print transformed the landscape of books and criticism. And here I was in the 21st century and the digital revolution was doing so again. While newspaper book review sections were shuttering and academic presses were struggling to stay afloat, Online reviews were helping to steer customers' buying decisions, along with the raw data of likes and stars. Now, uh, of course, I'm sure that some of you are probably thinking, okay, but an Amazon review isn't really criticism in the same way that a Stephen Greenblatt book on Shakespeare or a book review in the New York Times by Mashiku Kakutani is. Yet, Part of what my project tries to do is to recuperate the full range of forms that criticism takes and to ask what these forms tell us about the role of literary criticism within our culture. To be sure, an Amazon review of The Handmaid's Tale isn't the same as, say, a professional review by Daniel Mendelssohn or a scholarly monograph on 20th century dystopian novels, but each one reflects a different culture of critical practice that together gives us a more comprehensive sense of the place of literary criticism and indeed literature itself within our culture. What this moment shares uh, with the 19th century, I suggest, is a sense of disruption to critical norms brought on by rapid technological changes as we confront, depending on who you ask, either a democratization or a degradation of criticism, as well as a proliferation of outlets for criticism. Amid cultural overload, we increasingly turn to criticism to help us make choices, to winnow the grain from the chaff, whether that be a James Wood or Emily Nussbaum review in The New Yorker, or a critical amalgamator like Rotten Tomatoes. While my project is set in the antebellum period, I find these comparisons productive, helping us see more clearly both our own moment and the more remote world of the mid 19th century. Now, while the digital transition has caused criticism to reorient itself in the past few decades, in the antebellum period from roughly 1830 to 1860, the focus of my study, the American critical industry experienced its first great period of expansion, including the emergence of a new kind of figure, the professional critic. These developments were driven by a series of technological changes transforming antebellum print culture as Americans witnessed what scholars have termed the cheap print revolution. In the 1830s and 40s, the rise of industrial print alongside improved transportation and communication infrastructure, as well as a centralizing print industry, expanded the reach while decreasing the price of literature. We also see the rise of major publishing houses like Putnam's, Harper's, Appleton's, and at the same time, the number of venues in which criticism appeared, periodicals especially, increased making critics a more central figure. It was the golden age of periodicals, as historian Frank Luther Mott termed it. For while in 1825, there were less than 100 non-newspaper periodicals, by 1850, there were approximately 600. The changes applied to newspapers as well. With the advent of the penny press, beginning with Benjamin Day's New York Sun in 1833, the price of newspapers went from six cents down to one or two cents, making it affordable for just about everyone. As a result, as you see in 1830, while there were 65 daily papers with a circulation for around 78,000, by 1840, that number had gone up to 138 papers with a circulation of 300,000. And that was just in a 10 year period. It kept going up and up and up in the ensuing decades. This print revolution was accompanied by a corresponding reading revolution. Literacy, Uh, rates expanded, along with the growth of new reading demographics among women, children, and the working classes. Improvements in eyeglasses and lighting, things we probably take for granted now, made reading less of a strain on the eyes. So too, book historians point to a shift from so-called intensive reading to extensive reading. 
Well, the 18th century, well, in the 18th century, readers tended to buy fewer books and read them over and over again. For instance, the Bible, Shakespeare, maybe an almanac. By the mid 19th century, amid a growing Victorian commodity culture, readers began buying more books and magazines, which they read just once. These changes confronted readers with a daunting sense of print surplus, of there being too much to know, to borrow Anne Blair's title about uh, the late medieval, early modern period. And while this sense of being overwhelmed by books wasn't new exactly, the anxiety reached a larger number of readers, while the problem itself was exacerbated by the increased capacities of production and distribution. Yet these changes also had the effect of elevating the figure of the critic, who became increasingly important for helping readers navigate the new landscape of print. Um, now, while some viewed these developments with skepticism, others viewed them more positively. For instance, Edward Terrell Channing, the Boylston Professor of Rhetoric and Oratory at Harvard, noted in a lecture to Harvard seniors and then later an essay entitled Forms of Criticism that, Within the present century, English reviews have risen to an importance that they never knew before. And the change is so striking an event in recent literary history, it is so truly a distinction of the age that it receives great consideration from those who carefully observe the times. Instead of short analyses, summaries of literary news and slight strictures, reviews now contain elaborate investigations of the subjects of works, of the genius of authors, the principles of criticism, the faults and beauties of style and language. There is no dispute that they are part of our most popular and fashionable and instructive reading and fill a large place in public private libraries and, and private libraries. Subjects of all sorts of local and temporary or general and permanent interest, the opinions of others upon, upon them, the manner in which others have treated them are placed within the reach of everybody. So that it will not do for anyone who reads at all to neglect the journals if he would be prepared to talk with all upon much that is occupying them. As uh, Channing concludes, the owner of a perfect series of a good review has, I will not say a systematic, but a most instructive and agreeable account of the period over which it extends in almost every point of view. Though throughout the antebellum period then, the critic became a recurring topic for discussion alternately hailed as heroic bulwarks against the ever rising tide of books, and alternately as parasites, hacks, and vultures, making their living by cutting down their intellectual superiors or corruptly serving the interests of the publishing industry. As such, just as we see numerous celebrations of the critic as the heroic man of letters, we also see numerous caricatures of critics sawing through books on the left here and impaling authors. We see them portrayed as pretent pret uh, pretentious dandies, pompously casting judgment on works of, ar of art, and alternately as bottom feeding vermin, uh, as we see on the right in this uh, lobster critic, of, or I think that's what he is, some sort of a lobster critic. This brings us to one of my favorite images, which is on the cover of my book in which several cute little books beg for their lives, offering bribes to no avail as they're impaled by the quills of heartless critics. Finally, nowhere is the contrast between these two conceptions, heroic man of letters and parasite, better seen than in two contemporaneous illustrations of Edgar Allan Poe, one of the period's most famous critics. The first, dignified and sedate on the left, appearing as part of Graham's Our Contributors series, the other in his capacity as the Tomahawk, a nickname Poe earned on his, uh, based on his reputation for mean-spirited slashing reviews and appearing in Holden's Dollar Magazine. It wasn't just in comic illustrations that these sorts of critiques uh, of critics thrived. Rather, these lampoons were a graphic subset of a broader literary genre that I term critical fiction in which critics and criticism became fodder for imaginative literature, a genre that included books like Fanny Fern's Ruth Hall, Herman Melville's Pierre, as well as lesser known works like the 1832, uh, this 1832 story in the New York Mirror entitled The Young Author or the Effects of Criticism, in which a sensitive young poet quite literally dies as the result of several cruel reviews. Yet whether hailed or satirized, pretty much everyone agreed that it was a critical age. 
This then is the setting for my book which I takes as its subject, as I've said, the American critical institution during its first great period of expansion, an expansion that prompted near continuous debates over the proper function of literary criticism in, expand, in an expanding reading public. Yet my book also departs from previous treatments of the topic by focusing less on enumerating aesthetic theories or detailing the clashes of competing cliques and coteries, Whigs or Democrats, Knickerbockers or Young America, or on the overarching paradigm of literary nationalism, which have dominated studies of criticism. Instead, it focuses more on the uses that criticism served within the culture, uses that I argue were closely aligned with the printed form criticism took. To be sure, literary nationalism was one concern of critics, but it wasn't the only concern. The book also resists what I've come to think of as the Nortonization of literary criticism. Um, and you know, here I'm referring to the Norton anthologies, which are a, a staple of teaching English. Um, so the Nortonization of literary criticism or the tendency to homogenize diverse expressions of critical practice into a single print form. Rather, adopting a book history and print culture methodologies, I return to the archives to examine the variety of material forms that criticism took during this period of rapid critical growth. Despite the prevalence of book history and print culture studies as critical methodologies, literary criticism itself has remained curiously exempt from materially focused examinations. Yet, these different forms, I argue, not only shaped the critical arguments contained, but revealed a, diff different, a variety of different functions that criticism served in antebellum culture from helping scholars keep pace with an international knowledge economy, to lively entertainment, to serving as effective political weapons amid the escalating slavery crisis. Moreover, criticism served all of these differing functions at once, while a single critic writing for different venues often adapted his or her theories to suit the context. In this sense, at its broadest level, the book raises the still timely question, what's criticism for? Indeed, one of the first challenges in writing about literary criticism is settling on a definition of it. And here on the screen, I have some of the variety of definitions from the original sense of criticos from the Greek of one capable of judging um, to Noah Webster's definition, the art of judging with propriety of the beauties and faults of literary performance from 1828 to a more, more recent definition by one of the great historians of literary criticism, Rene Wellick or any discourse on literature. Um, essentially, anyone writing about criticism has to start with their definition of it, but those definitions vary pretty uh, widely. So that in Andrew Ford's definition, which fo focuses on the literary culture of ancient Greece, he defines it as any public act of praise or blame um, upon a performance or song, something that makes sense for a largely oral culture of Greece, ancient Greece. Michael Gavin, by contrast, distinguishes critical writing defined as the generically heterogeneous mix of texts that engage arguments about poetry, plays, and prose fiction from, quote, criticism, defined more broadly as the socially realized exercise of judgment. Many scholars don't define criticism at all. In my own book, I argue that the definition of literary criticism is contingent upon the forms through which it's circulated. At its most general level, literary criticism is writing about books, a field of discourse that takes as its jumping off point other works. Depending on where a piece of criticism appeared, the nature and character of these responses could vary widely from the brief abstracts of literary notices to surveys of entire intellectual fields, from blunt evaluations of quality to sensitive explorations of authorial intent, from practical reviews to meta-discursive discussions of the nature of criticism itself. By critical form, meanwhile, I mean two intertwined and overlapping structures, the print media through which criticism circulated, for instance, monthly magazines, daily newspapers, anthologies, pamphlets, and the critical genres through which it expressed itself, a brief notice, lengthy review essay, tabloid literary gossip, etc. As such, critical form encompasses both print media and critical genre, the periodical, the dial, and the genre of the literary notices section at the back of the dial, an anthology and an authorial headnote. As a result, in organizing the book, 
instead of charting change over time or dueling critical movements as is typical, each chapter focuses on a different form of criticism during roughly the same period of time. One of my central arguments in the book, meanwhile, is that critical debates grounded themselves in debates over specific critical forms, as observers discuss the impact of, say, reviews in daily newspapers or wide circulation popular magazines. It was these print media that provided a concrete focus for otherwise abstract arguments about literature and criticism, tethering a realm of ideas to the world of daily experience. If this argument is new, the framework isn't. For instance, Channing, who, who we saw before, organized his account of uh, critical practice according to so-called forms of criticism, differentiating five main types, which you see here, private criticism, what he calls annotators, essentially critical editions, literary histories, aesthetics, liter and practical literary views. Um, I would suggest that we can name significantly more than five. Amid the rapid expansion of industrial print culture um, and beyond it, beyond print, the number of critical forms proliferated. In this slide, I've listed a sampling that shows the wide range of critical expressions from debates conducted by literary societies all the way to diary entries, all of which points to different social and cultural functions for criticism. In the five chapters of my book, I limit myself to just five of these, primarily from the printed and periodical realms, since these were the forms through which criticism reached its largest audience. Yet in the course of writing the book, I saw just how much work remains to be done on other iterations of critical culture. Specifically in each chapter, I focus on one significant critical form and on the debates that surrounded those forms, focusing my analysis on a well-known critical figure associated with that critical mode in question. In chapter one, Cutting Corners with Emerson, I begin with Ralph Waldo Emerson and the Quarterly Review. For Emerson, criticism helped make the scholar's task more manageable, providing invaluable glosses and digests of work. Um, and here I think we can all probably identify, right? How many of us have read a review um, and, and you know, talked about the book as if we had read it? Here I argue for the critical, uh, the crucial role that criticism in the Quarterly Reviews played with an inter, uh, within an international knowledge culture offering scholars condensed surveys of not only books or thinkers, but entire surveys and fields. It also helped overcome the material challenge of access to books by introducing thinkers like Emerson and Theodore Parker, pictured here, to new streams of thought and all within an easily accessible form. And I, I love this image here. This is Christopher Peirce Cranch, who would often do kind of doodles and illustrations of the transcendentalist circle. And here we see, um, Theodore Parker's excitement at going into a bookstore in Germany, right? Because he could find all these books that were so difficult to access elsewhere. At the same time though, Emerson's own arguments adapted themselves to suit their context, whether lecture, circuit, uh, lecture or print. While at the broadest level, his anxieties regarding the overwhelming number of books confronting the modern reader shaped Emerson's own critical theory. And in particular, his rejection of the burden of tradition and the proclamation of intellectual self-reliance made famous in lectures and essays like The American Scholar or Literary Ethics. So this is the sort of work that each chapter does, tracing the reciprocal influence of critical forms and critical theories, as well as the practical functions criticism served in the culture. In chapter two, I move from the quarterly essay to the literary anthology, as I trace debates over the role of literary, the literary compilation and giving shape to an American canon. Not only did anthologies give concrete form to critical judgments, they expressed theories of literary history. For Rufus Griswold, America's first professional anthologist, anthologies made American literature's strengths and deficiencies visible to the current generation, thereby establishing a path for future achievements. Yet at the same time, his anthologies were limited by the physical con constraints of the book as a commodity tensions that produced heated debate with his adversaries, the Dykink brothers, over just what principles American anthologies should abide by. In chapter three, I turn to Poe, who was a linchpin of sorts for the project. For while Poe insisted that the national literature would not improve without fearless, honest critics like himself, he also felt that criticism was superfluous to the true aims and experiences of art. 
and though he wrote over a thousand reviews, he worried constantly about the increasing corruption of the critical industry. These contradictions, and, and here these two quotes express the kind of his competing contradictory thoughts on criticism within the same installment of marginalia, showing just kind of how conflicted he was on this. These contradictions, I argue, were rooted in part in Poe's close association with wide circulation popular monthly magazines like Graham's and Godey's, in which criticism, as well as the antics of bickering literati, became a form of popular entertainment in its own right. In chapter four, I explore Margaret Fuller's career as newspaper critic. While Fuller made a name for herself as editor of the Transcendentalist Dial, she left New England in 1844 to take a position as literary editor of Horace Greeley's New York Tribune. In the 18 months that Fuller occupied the post, she turned the genre of the newspaper book review, long disparaged as the lowest form of criticism, into a respected medium for the genre, inaugurating the tradition of the newspaper book review in the United States and deploying it in the service of social reform. If newspapers empowered the critical office by expanding its audience and its demographic, the demographic range of its readership, however, the ephemerality of the material form also limited the temporal reach of her writings, right? After all, we don't really keep newspapers, right? We throw them away. As a result, though the newspaper media made Fuller the most widely read American critic of the day, it also proved debilitating to her critical legacy. Finally, in chapter five, I trace the critical response to Uncle Tom's Cabin in three critical forms that have been largely ignored in, the critical, in critical history, pamphlet reviews, critical companion volumes, and reprinted reviews and periodicals. Much of this chapter focuses on the phenomenon of critical reprinting, a practice that challenges 20th century conceptions of critical value. As I argue in this concluding chapter, however, the very same material characteristics that have rendered these forms marginal, if not invisible, within critical history, in fact points to the social centrality of criticism, as editors like Frederick Douglass harness the power of reprinting to turn criticism into a powerful weapon within the ongoing debates over slavery and abolition. In the process, we see how a material approach to literary criticism provides a fuller and more empowered sense of the role criticism plays within our culture. Now, in the remaining few minutes of this presentation, I wanna show you what this critical approach lo looks like in practice with a few examples from the final chapter of the project, which I added to the book during my time at AAS as a postdoctoral fellow. In Uncle Tom's Cabin, we find a book that not only strained the conventions of literary criticism, but foisted it to the center of the culture and cultural and political arena. The scale of the novel's success produced a media frenzy with one reviewer for Putnam's Magazine declaring that the novel had ushered in a new age of print. Almost immediately, critics fanned out to cover what had rapidly turned into a cultural phenomenon. They reported on the novel's unprecedented sales and on Boston publisher John P. Jewett's attempts to keep up with them. They reported on spin-offs, reception abroad in England and elsewhere, and published remarks by prominent figures. Above all, criticism reprinted and responded to other criticism as the cycle of reviewing became a self-generating engine distinct from the novel itself. The flood of responses forced criticism into instant self-reflexivity. Within weeks, commentators couldn't begin an article without reference to the redundancy of their task. Southerners in particular couldn't attack the novel without first noting that all refutations had already been made. The novel also began testing the traditional parameters of criticism as reviews started bursting at their seams, running to 40 pages or spreading out in multiple installments. As one frustrated Southern critic, Louisa McCord complained, quote, but what argument avails against broad, flat, impudent assertion? The greatest villain may swear down an honest man and the greatest falsehoods are often as those which it is impossible to disprove. But our argument is becoming so prolix that we must cut it short. We could run on for 50 pages showing our author's blunders and inconsequences. These quotations are so delightfully racy that we find it difficult to abridge them, but we are fast nearing the utmost limit of our article and must stop. McCord wasn't the only one to feel limited by the traditional constraints of the book review. Indeed, one of the most noticeable phenomena prompted by the success of Uncle Tom's Cabin was the widespread practice of reprinting reviews as pamphlets, the tactic that helped overcome the limitations on length, audience, and temporal shelf life 
involved in periodical publication. For some critics, even the enlarged format of pamphlets proved too constricting, prompting the development of a new phenomenon in American critical history, the production of book-length reviews, point-by-point -point critical rebuttals of Stowe's novel stretching to hundreds of pages and issued as a standalone volume, often with elaborate production value in their own, own right a critical subgenre that included Stowe's own a key, to Uncle's Tom, a key to Uncle Tom's Cabin. Just as pamphlets recirculated reviews, periodicals like Frederick Douglass's paper also frequently reprinted reviews and notices from other papers. During my year at AAS, as I surveyed the response to Uncle Tom's Cabin in the early black press, and in Frederick Douglass's paper in particular, I began to notice a peculiarity. Though Douglas's journal treated the novel extensively, scholars tended to return to only a handful of these critical responses. As I asked why, I began to see that the reason had something to do with our 21st century definitions of what constitutes critical authority. Namely, we tend to privilege original signed reviews by critics of established reputation that take familiar forms readily recognizable as serious literary criticism, right? Um, things determined by length, genre, established canons of practice. Conversely, scholars tend to discount criticism that is anonymous, reprinted from other papers, or by amateur correspondents, and that employ less traditional critical forms with low authority. This is what happened in studies of reviews of Uncle Tom's Cabin and Frederick Douglass's paper, which returned over and over to a few signed articles by well-known Black writers like Douglass, William J. Wilson, Martin Delaney, and William G. Allen. Yet, as I discovered, these responses constituted only a very small number of the treatments of Stowe's novel. Rather, as I conducted my research, I found that between April 8, 1852 and April 1, 1853, roughly a year, Douglas included no fewer than 75 pieces that responded to Stowe's novel in some form or other. Of these, over 40, more than half, were culled from other papers, a percentage that increases to two thirds when one includes reprinted addresses, minutes, and proceedings that address Stowe's novel. Douglas reprinted articles from over 25 different papers, from the Honolulu Friend to the Revue de Du Monde, some of which were already reprints themselves. In lieu of an author, the articles are attributed to the source periodical. Rather, instead of privileging originality and critical identity, Douglas's editorial strategy followed what Lara Linger Cohen in describing the features of the early black press terms a patchwork aesthetic. These critical responses took a wide variety of forms, moreover, which included reprinted reviews from other papers, accounts of sales numbers, international printings, minutes from congressional sessions and anti-slavery meetings, biographical sketches of Stowe, um, all sorts of material. Uh, they included controversies over the book, like the libel suit um, by Reverend Joel Parker, testimonials from Southerners attesting to the truth of the narrative, accounts of dramatizations, dioramas, etc. cetera. Um, they included original and reprinted reviews of anti-Tom novels, introductions to English editions, remarks by British dignitaries. Above all, they included letters from correspondents praising or critiquing the novel and commenting on its impact. And these are just a, a few of them. Each of these different forms in turn revealed complex new dimensions for the critical arguments contained connecting responses to the novel to a wide range of communities, social arenas, and print media whose respective powers Douglas harnessed through the strategic act of reprinting. But to give one example, in July of 1852, a correspondent wrote into Douglas's paper to ask why he had never printed a quote, proper notice in response to Stowe's novel. In the very same issue, uh, in this very same issue, however, Douglas included an account of a three-day trip to Ithaca, New York, under the title Letter from, Letter from the Editor. In traveling through the town, Douglas marveled at the pleasing change in the public opinion of the place since his last visit 10 years earlier. In accounting for the change, Douglas notes that, though the fugitive slave law and the cumulative effect of anti-slavery lectures and papers must be held partly responsible, it must be conceded Quote, it must be conceded that the most efficient agent, agent in changing the sentiment of Ithaca, as well as elsewhere, must be set down to the circulation of Uncle Tom's Cabin. That book is but at the beginning of its career, and it goes like fire through a dry stubble, sweeping all before it. 
And yet, just the previous day, in the very same letter from the editor in, uh, installment, Douglas records his surprise and discomfort when, upon arriving at a scheduled address to the Black congregation of Zion Church, he discovered that the audience was, quote, contrary to my expectation and partly to, partly to my wishes, largely composed of white persons, adding his concern that, quote, there are some things which ought to be said to colored people in the peculiar circumstances in which they are placed that can be said more effectively among themselves without the presence of white persons. For as Douglas adds, we are the oppressed, the whites are the oppressors, and the language I would address to the one is not always suited to the other. In the address that followed, moreover, Douglas recalled that, quote, I aim to impress upon my friends in my speech the importance of helping themselves, a lesson that took on a decidedly ironic coloring given the largely white audience. Just as unconventional forms allowed Douglas to register contradictions, they also allowed him to provide an editorial buffer. For instance, in one essay entitled Negro Intellect, Ellis and Douglas and Uncle Tom, reprinted from the national era, an unknown contributor who went by E critiques the model of black victimhood represented by Uncle Tom, suggesting that both Douglas and Harrison W. Ellis, viewed by some as the model for Stowe's Uncle Tom, were both preferable to Stowe's vision of pious submission. As the contributor insists, instead of figures like Tom, quote, let us have more blacksmiths, scholars, orators, philosophers, and natural noblemen of the race. We have victims enough already, and sympathy for suffering will be more profitably replaced by admiration for evincible magnanimity. Piety, as in the case of Uncle Tom, and apparently in that of Reverend Ellis, is capable of being prostituted in the service of slavery. Because it acts upon the life mainly as a sentiment, it can be perverted into a sort of spiritual and moral handcuff and be made to answer the master as a restraint upon natural liberty. Surely there were some who might bristle at, a Christ, at Christian devotion being described as, quote, a moral and spiritual handcuff. But by reprinting the essay, Douglas could express the opinion without bearing responsibility for it. So too, through reprinting, Douglas could voice more militant views, as when he printed the opinion of a contributor who went by sans nom, who observed that the logical conclusion to be drawn from Uncle Tom's Cabin was that, quote, it is proper and necessary to provide arms for fugitives at convenient places and to encourage and instruct them in their use, in service of which he suggests the creation of a fugitive arms fund. Finally, Douglas's embrace of a variety of critical forms allowed him to stage vibrant debates over topics of central concern rather than just his own critical view, including the impact uh, on the, the impact of works like Uncle Tom's Cabin. The most famous of these epistolary exchanges is with Martin Delaney over the appropriateness of accepting help in the anti-slavery cause from a white woman like Stowe, who as Delaney notes, knows nothing about us. Douglas's reply that until the black community was in a stronger position, they should accept help that the help that was proffered was, pragma was pragmatic, much like his approach to literary criticism. All of these examples, meanwhile, point to the rich critical conversations that existed in forms that didn't necessarily register as a quote, proper notice. To conclude, much of the power of Douglas's strategy of reprinting comes from modes of authority that should look familiar to us in our age of Facebook and Twitter. Through reprinting, Douglas performed 19th century versions of sharing, liking, tweeting, and reposting. He helped articles go viral and created a comment section of sorts. Above all, through his newspaper, he created a forum for discussion among the black community, which privileged letters from correspondents as much, much as it did his own critical voice. Many of these forms that he employed carry either low critical authority by our modern definitions or don't qualify as criticism at all. Yet as I've argued, they paradoxically point to the centrality of literary criticism within, within antebellum culture. So too, we might bring similar sorts of insights to our own moment. Could Goodreads.com and Amazon reviews be a sign of criticism's cultural reach, its widespread adoption, and evidence of engagement with social problems through books? Could a book review that's shared or reposted express new kinds of evidence of cultural impact? Rather than the often invoked crisis of the humanities, perhaps we're entering a new age of critical participation. While I don't have definitive answers to these questions, I believe that an attention to critical form empowers us in our sense of what functions criticism performs and its reach within our culture. When we take a more expansive view of the forms that criticism takes, we see that it remains a vital genre for our culture to discuss its most pressing concerns, 
offering a hopeful view of the state of the humanities and literary criticism in the early decades of the 21st century. And with that, uh, I'll stop there. Thank you all again for listening and for being here. Great, thank you very much, Adam. Thanks. So, uh, we do have uh, several questions already in the Q&A queue. Uh, so if folks that are watching do have uh, additional questions, you can look at those questions and vote them up uh, if they're repetitive to something you're thinking of. Um, and if you have uh, new questions, you're welcome to add and submit those there. And in just a moment, I'll begin to, to read those off. Um, before I get uh, to that list, I do have a few questions uh, to get started, uh, Adam, on my, on my own here. Um, first off, uh, you know, on the surface, your book really uh, discusses uh, the rise of the professional literary critic in the 19th century. Uh, however, uh, I think underneath that, uh, there's a really interesting argument uh, where you're asking us to uh, really broaden the definition of what counts as literary criticism. Um, and I, I might ask in a moment for you to kind of go back to a slide where uh, you uh, had referenced uh, Edward Channing's uh, forms of criticism. And yeah. you know, in, in the book, you actually mention uh, you know, four different types of criticism uh, addressed in the work. Uh, but you also, you know, add this really remarkable list uh, of other forms of criticism, yeah. <laughs> um, which is equally as interesting, I think. Uh, so to kind of get started, um, uh, maybe kind of beginning with Channing and we can move forward a bit. Uh, how was literary criticism in the antebellum period defined um, by Channing and, and by others? And, uh, and then we'll kind of maybe move into how you ask us to kind of expand upon that. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. And, um, you know, the, the immediate answer is that they disagreed. I mean, there were a lot of different, um, there were a lot of different views on what criticism was and what it should do. And some of those were charted in kind of more traditional studies. So for instance, the clearest distinction was, was between like a neoclassical definition that said, criticism should really judge by established rules, right? Beauties, faults, where something failed in its representation versus a more romantic um, conception. Um, they often called it kind of reproductive or sympathetic criticism that said really, no, the critic's job is to uh, help us see what the author, what the genius was trying to do, right? And that since artistic genius is idiosyncratic, there is no one rule. And you really see these different definitions kind of at loggerheads um, with a lot of the critics from the period. You know, so while Poe represents kind of a severe, more neoclassical version of what criticism should do, someone like Edwin Percy Whipple um, is, is more of a romantic in his sense that uh, art is variable and the critic's job is to um, help us understand it, to bring some expertise to um, our interpretation of it. Um, yeah. So, you know, you ask a good question. Even at the time, the definition of literary criticism was um, all over the place. I should say, too, that literature at that period also isn't our modern sense of imaginative literature. It is polite letters more broadly. So a literary critic would be reviewing stuff that, you know, wasn't just a novel or a poem. Margaret Fuller was reviewing you know, accounts of asylums at the time. You know, she was a public intellectual in the sense of a, a, of a critic. So it, it was unstable then, just as it's unstable now. Mm. Uh, and, and that in instability uh, is also of interest to me here too, because part of that, that disagreement, part of that, you know, the dialogue that uh, uh, is being had between critics and between critics and, and others, um, is really, uh, you know, and this ties into, I think, an, another kind of thread in the book, ties into um, our sense of national tastes, national identity, yeah, uh, and ultimately, you know, those philosophies and practices that are tied to democracy. So yeah. uh, how do we make sense of that? How does the critic and literary criticism, uh, you know, make meaning or... Uh, uh, you know, take part in democratic systems 
Uh, or maybe a larger question might be, uh, you know, what is the cultural importance of criticism? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's it's a hard question and it's a good one. Um, I mean, I think it, it depends partly on what you, well, A, how you define criticism, but B, what you look for it to do. I mean, if we look today at the difference between an Amazon review and like an A.O. Scott review, I mean, they aren't the, the same thing. And while I think it's easy to dismiss like the Amazon review as, you know, being an uninformed subjective response by a reader, it does give you an index of like what real readers thought of something at the time, right? And in that sense, a kind of a democratic understanding of criticism can be productive in creating forums for discussing works of literature. That being said, A.O. Scott has knowledge, expertise, training as a writer, and can help someone see something with more clarity, right? I mean, I think critics at their best are trained thinkers and writers who bring to a work of literature uh, a precision of analysis. Maybe we would hope a kind of a balance, right? Though. You know, it's I'm in thinking of our own turbulent political context now. And of course, you know, in the mid 19th century too, they were very divided. People read their newspapers based on whether they were Whigs or whether they're Democrats. And a lot of people have argued that those political distinctions are what should determine our understanding of criticism at the time. And in a way, I actually try to push back about that kind of nationalist understanding because it's it's a bit too narrow, criticism can do a whole lot of different things. Um, and, you know, if we view all of them, I think it's empowering and, and democratizing, right? To see everyone having a critical voice, but, um, but I can see kind of what you're insinuating also that like, is it bad for democracy when everyone, <laughs> you know, gets a, an unmediated voice? Should we be controlling the platforms through which people get to talk? Or does opening things up more broadly um, help us? But I mean, in answer to your question, I think at the best, um, criticism helps us see works more clearly. Um, and I'm sure all of us have done this. You know, we've read a book and then they read the review of it after. I mean, sometimes we read it first to decide what to read, but sometimes we want like help understanding what's going on, you know, and ideally a critic is knowledgeable and can help guide us to, you know, bring in new context that might help us understand it. So, I mean, I think that's probably, you know, what we can, we should hope for from critics. And that applies to all sorts of books where, you know, whether they're on like, you know, authoritarianism or on, you know, gardens in the romantic period. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, looking at the time, I want to I actually uh, slide over to the Q and A. Yeah, sorry, uh, I was long. I always try to no, keep it short, and I can never do it. Terrific. No, don't apologize. Uh, the first question is actually in the in a similar vein about uh, democratization, and in this case. Uh, uh, regarding the democratization of access to literature. So let me read this. Uh, do you think criticism's expansion in the 19th century contributed to a democratization of access to literature or an opposite tendency where one was expected to be credentialed, uh, a credentialed expert uh, and to have something valuable to say about literature? Yeah, so that's a good, uh, it's a good question. and. You know, I, I emphasize kind of technological shifts and changes in print culture, but there are a whole lot of other factors that you could also see as like driving the shift in criticism, including, um, you know, Paul Starr has a book on kind of increasing professionalization in the medical industry. Um, and that's true across all fields. The 19th century saw a growth in kind of professionalization, right? The sense that you um, need to have certain credentials in order to be qualified to talk about something. So, um, and this is a shift from the kind of the amateur gentleman critic of the late 18th century, when, you know, a, a lawyer or a doctor kind of who had a literary interest would send in his views to a magazine and they would publish it. So there is a kind of increasing restriction on who gets to talk, at least in kind of traditional accounts of um, literary criticism. I mean, that's why I find Frederick Douglass's employment of uh, letters to be really interesting. 
But at the same time, you know, with someone say like Margaret Fuller, Fuller, you know, a newspaper is a place where people really did have increased access um, to reading material. It got really cheap and everyone started reading newspapers. And so, you know, one of the things that Margaret Fuller did was she brought discussions of literature to the front page of the New York Tribune. And these weren't quick little reviews, they were lengthy. I mean, in a sense, you can see her as teaching people how to read through the form of the newspaper book review um, with a real desire for a kind of a more democratic democratization of literature. Um, that is, she is both modeling, um, you know, and even the fact that you would have lengthy excerpts from things, which this is funny, in scholarship, people tend to like leave the excerpts out, but it was a way of actually giving readers a chunk of literature to read, you know, rather than something superfluous. Um, so yeah, but I'll stop there, but it's a good question. Mm. Uh, the next one is actually, uh, I think a little bit more about the, the forms of criticism. Uh, how would literary criticism in the 19th century have been distinguished from reviews? Yeah, I mean, that's a good, that's a good question too. And the, the language for this stuff gets en endlessly confusing. I mean, literary criticism, I guess, would be the broadest umbrella term and reviews would be a subset, right? A review is a specific um, uh, critical estimation of a specific book as opposed to a broader kind of critical essay um, or they would have something called like literary notices or basically just like little announcements of a book with hardly any critical estimation. So a review is a type of literary criticism but a lot of energy has been spent like disambiguating these various kinds of forms from one another. Um, you know, like literary theory versus aesthetic, aesthetics versus literary criticism. Um, yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, the following question uh, uh, is about Poe. Uh, you described Poe's uh, concern for the corruption of literature through criticism. Do you feel that criticism serves as a productive process for literature? Or do you side with Poe's anxieties about its interference? Yeah, <laughs> um, I mean, I think I, maybe I'm naive, but I think that criticism is productive, right? That said, there is a lot of bad criticism out there, right? That is basically just a subjective rant that doesn't do anything good. I mean, I think there are some critics who have different styles and like want to be inflammatory, right? And that's what gets them attention. Um, you know, they're like Anthony Lane in The New Yorker, he's like humorous, right? It's fun to read his, his reviews. So um, I, I don't think that criticism is corrupt that much. I mean, I think I just accept the reality that like the literary industry is powerful and knows how to get books reviewed in the first place. But I think um, critics themselves do their best to be honest. I mean, that said, it's up to us to, to read critics that we think are worth reading and to not read ones that are not worth our time and energy. Uh, we have an, another uh, question here regarding the genre of biography. So how do you feel about, uh, or how, what do you think about the genre of biography or life writing in relation to literary criticism? Uh, and the example here uh, is really about uh, those sorts of uh, works uh, that have some sort of preface or introduction um, that might criticize or critique the author's work. And the example given is uh, Dunlap's uh, The Life of Charles Brockton Brown. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question too. I mean, I, I absolutely think that something like a biography or an edition of a, of a writer's writings is an expression of criticism. I mean, that's why I included a chapter on literary anthologies, you know, which one could say like, that's not criticism. Um, but to me, those practical applications of critical, select, uh, critical principles, critical ideas, takes on an author, take physical material form in the process of editing. I mean, it's what the, the theorist Gerard, uh, Gerard Jeanette calls paratext, right? Paratext frame the way we understand a text or a writer, right? And it's for this reason, I mean, to give a good example of this, 
you know, part of the reason Rufus Griswold is so disparaged is because he wrote this infamous early biography of Poe and he, he um, released Poe's um, works in editions that he edited, even though he didn't really like Poe very much. And so he created this image of Poe as a kind of an alcoholic, you know, and a, um, a scoundrel that persisted for a long time and wasn't entirely accurate, you know? And so there's a lot of power to create the idea of an author through, through editing. So that's at, you know, one of the most powerful expressions of criticism. Mm, great, yeah. Uh, we have another question here um, uh, about Boston. Uh, so Boston was the center of the antebellum, uh, of, of antebellum publishing uh, as the heads of publishing houses promoted uh, their own self-serving interests. Did they explicitly engage in fostering criticism of the works of other publishing houses? And, and what was the consequence, uh, uh, and as a consequence, launch a reaction back on their own doorsteps? There we go. Yeah, and that's, and that's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> you know, despite my answer to the previous question that like criticism, I don't think criticism today is all that corrupt. You know, there was, there was a lot of like behind the scenes work that was done between publishers and critics in the period. Some of it is above board, right? It's just how things work. So for instance, they would send review copies, right? I mean, it's a, you take it for granted, but it was a very powerful way to like get things noticed and reviewed, right? Um, you know, but there's a lot of like critical satires at the times on the ways that people would try to influence reviews. Um, and certainly, you know, a lot of the magazines during this time were produced by some of the publishing houses, right? So there's a very cozy relationship between, um, you know, uh, you know, the, the publisher Putnam's and Putnam's magazine. Uh, I, I wonder to the degree though, that like whether they're like panning competing books, I think it works more in kind of um, promotion of their own wares rather than disparagement of others. That said, there was a lot of disparagement, but that often seemed to come more from like personal animosities, right? Like it was a smaller literary world. So people that didn't like each other would often review each other's work quite negatively. Um, so there was kind of, positive corruption, though, I, I wanna say, I, I don't know if I stand by this completely, but the, a little less negative corruption, though, you know, someone like Poe would disagree with me here. <laughs> uh, I'm, looking, <laughs> I'm looking at the time here. We, we have time for one last question, okay. um, and then we'll wrap things up for the day. Um, I do thank everybody for, for being here, uh, especially for what's a rainy uh, day in Worcester here. Um, I hope it's uh, nicer weather where you are. Um, uh, you do frame the book, as, as you've mentioned in the presentation, around uh, you know, uh, following this analogy between uh, 18, the 1820s and uh, uh, kind of the, the rise of uh, new technologies, of the reading revolution, et cetera, uh, and uh, our own, uh, you know, uh, current situation with uh, kind of slowly kind of, I know it seems slowly, <laughs> slowly um, uh, kind of opening up the doors of electronic modes uh, of delivery. Um, so you made these connections between uh, Amazon and Goodreads and the like. Um, I'm wondering, uh, you know, as we, and, and you mentioned this in the, the beginning of the talk as well, uh, the idea that, you know, the 1820s uh, literary criticism was a form itself of disruption. Uh, and then it ultimately kind of evolved into you know, the convention, the norm, right? Um, I'm wondering uh, what lessons uh, can be learned from the 1820s to 1850s as we kind of evolve uh, and, uh, you know, trek through uh, the electronic age. Yeah, well, I mean, this is a, a kind of a classic response within book history, but you know, there's always these two arguments whenever a period goes through change. One is that like change is always happening and it's not as catastrophic as you think versus like, oh my God, everything is different. Um, and, you know, I guess I would say that, um, you know, part of what 
uh, you know, part of what I'm suggesting in looking at the modern critical scene is that all of these different forms have value. Um, they're different values, but like it or not, you know, I think we need to reckon with some of the ones that seem more disruptive and unruly. I mean, in particular, because like, if you look at how many people, I mean, I just wrote this book, right? And how many people are going to read it, right? I mean, how many people read that kind of literary criticism, a scholarly monograph, whereas, you know, there was um, a, a short story um, called Cat Person that came out a few years ago that the critical response to it was truly viral, right? There were um, on Reddit, on Twitter, on Facebook, people were having these really vibrant discussions on the themes um, that, you know, it was a story essentially about consent that were in this story. And I guess my, my you know, my thought there would be that that matters, right? I mean, just because it isn't by Oxford University Press or the New York Times, in a hundred years to come back to this moment and look at that form of criticism and to see how people were talking about gender relations, about sexual consent. I mean, that's a really powerful form of evidence for us in seeing our culture. Um, and so I'm not saying that we shouldn't also be reading scholars and professional critics, but that they all have something different to add to the conversation that gives us a, a fuller picture, more broadly speaking. And, you know, I think we limit ourselves when we only look at a small number of those. And that was true in the 19th century. And I think it's true today, you know? And so, I, you know, I vote for a kind of a, a broader, more expansive, I mean, we're still looking at the slide of forms of criticism. And I'll be honest, I've gotten crap for this kind of slide, you know? And I, it, when I was doing writing my dissertation, one of my advisors asked me, what isn't criticism, you know? And he's kind of right, you know? Like I have a very broad definition of criticism, but to me, that's more productive than, than overly policing it with a very narrow definition of criticism. So um, even though our, in our current moment, a lot of these critical venues can be rancorous and ugly, I still think it's an index of what our culture is doing. And as a scholar, I think it's important to look at that. Thank you. Thank you I so hope much. That answered, I hope that answered your question. No, it did. It did. It did. And, uh, you know, um, I have uh, a couple more pages filled with questions for you. We didn't get into any specifics on Emerson or Fuller or, uh, yeah. or Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, of course. Uh, for those uh, who are interested, um, uh, I do recommend that uh, you go out and purchase Adam's book. If you haven't already done so, uh, a link uh, will be added to uh, the chat function again. Um, and if uh, you, if I didn't, if we didn't get to your question, I might, um, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll go back to the last slide with my email, um, which you can also find at uh, my Whitman, uh, at just searching me Adam Gordon Whitman, but feel free to email me as well. Terrific. And I, I do send all of the questions uh, that haven't been answered to uh, our, our guest. So, um, Adam, you'll receive a copy of these okay. um, for your files. Um, so with that, I would like to thank Adam for joining us today. Um, because of the uh, holiday season that is actually uh, quickly sneaking up uh, upon us, uh, there is a slight change in our schedule for November and uh, December. Uh, our next guest is Rodrigo Lazo, uh, who is scheduled in two weeks uh, from today on November 12th. Uh, his presentation will focus on his recent book, Letters from Philadelphia. Uh, and then in December, uh, on December 3rd, Bridget Fielder will discuss her new book, Relative Races, Genealogies of Interracial Kinship in, the 19, in 19th Century America. So with that, thank you again, Adam. Um, please remember to check out future AAS programs and to sign up for our FIBAC mailing list. So thanks to each of you for attending today. And until next time, uh, thank you and be well. <laughs>